Good evening, everybody. I'm Blair Hartley, the Director of Development at Film and Lincoln Center, and we are delighted you have joined us this evening for the discussion of Summerland with Director Jessica Swale, Gugu Mbata Ra, and Gemma Archerton, and moderated by Tiffany Vasquez, editor at Giphy and curating all film comment content there. And I hope you all enjoyed Summerland. We would like to thank our friends at IFC Films for making the screening of Summerland and tonight's Q&A possible and also American Airlines, the official airline of Film at Lincoln Center for its year-round support, as well as the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation for their year-round support. <clears throat> now, more importantly, before we begin, I must thank Campari for being our presenter of this exceptional patron event. And also, I personally hope that all of you took advantage of the Negroni recipe that Campari provided for all of us. It, it, of course, quite delicious. Uh, earlier this week, you should have heard that Chloe Zhao's Nomadland starring Frances McDormand was selected as the centerpiece of this year's New York Film Festival. Please do keep your eyes on your email over the next week or two because there are going to be many festival announcements that will be coming out. It's going to be an exciting year. And then make sure to check out our virtual cinema too. New films open every Friday. This Friday, it's Koji Fukada's A Girl Missing, their newest selection. So please join in for that. And finally, most importantly, Tonight would not be possible without the commitment of our patrons. So thank you to each and every one of you who has joined us tonight uh, for your continued support. During these times, it is absolutely crucial and we thank each and every one of you. Now, without any further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to our moderator, Tiffany Vasquez. Hello everyone, hi patrons. I'm so glad to continue to celebrate movies with you in every way possible that we can right now. And I'm so, so, so privileged to be here, e here, <laughs> with director Jessica Swale, stars Gemma Archerton, and Gugu Mbata Ra to discuss Summerland. Um, we've all got our Negronis ready and ready to talk about this very, very warm, comforting, comforting and lovely movie. Um, I'm gonna ask some questions for about half an hour and then we'll take some questions from you all um, a little bit after that. So get them ready. And we'll start with Jessica. Um, obviously, we wanna know just how this story came about, how long is it in the making, and just how did it get made? Oh, a whole host of questions. <laughs> um, I began writing this probably five years ago. And um, I was a theater director uh, originally, and then a writer in theater, I, I really, hadn't um, ever really thought about making movies. I adored the cinema, but I um, cut my teeth in the theatre and I was so happy working there. I hadn't really expected to jump across, but actually um, BAFTA were very generous in sort of providing a bursary and they were looking for writers who were working in other media and to tempt over um, to write for the screen. And that's because they felt that that was a bit of a lack sometimes of original storytelling in cinema because a lot of writers coming up, um, the opportunities were to write part of a franchise or to write something based on a book or something that was already successful. And it's really important to tell stories from scratch. And so um, I was chosen to be one of those writers. And so I literally started with a blank piece of paper, which is really, really unusual <laughs> for the most part. Um, you know, you, you begin with a kernel of something or a clue, there's a uh, character in a newspaper or someone you've met or something you read about in history, but their challenge was this cannot be based on an idea you've had before. You have to start with nothing at all. So I began by asking myself, why write for the screen? What can cinema do that we don't do in other modes of storytelling and that I couldn't necessarily do on the stage? And I started thinking, well, when I want to go to the cinema, I, I want to escape and I want to be transported. And the joy of um, the sort of visual landscape of what cinema can do is that you can do anything and you can make magic. And I love magic realism. And I find that notion that something, something small just outside our normal reality um, existing. I find that really exciting and kind of magical and a bit sexy and mysterious. And I thought it'd be lovely to tell a story where that was the case. For me, the sort of science fiction end of that was a bit of a leap, but 
but telling a story of reality with just a, tin, a tinge or a hint of something else is um, much more sort of tonally satisfying for me. So I started thinking about magic and that led me to think about folklore and myths and legends and actually the other part of it was that um, Brexit was just beginning when um, I started thinking about what was important to me. And it made me think about the fact that I'm English. And for the first time, I felt actually really quite uncomfortable and embarrassed about what English meant. I thought it, it felt quite racist. It felt something that could be sort of associated with a nationalism or cutting ourselves off. And, and I felt really disappointed about that because actually I love being English, but I needed to identify what that meant and what it was that I loved about this country in a sort of not George and the Dragon kind of a way, in a not, you know, a national front kind of a way. And I thought, actually, what I love about the idea of England is the sort of the land, the ancient land and the Cornish coast and the stories and Stonehenge and old graveyards and the idea that people have been here forever and a day. And what are those stories and where do they come from? And who might I be if I was investigating that and that led me to create Alice um, so that's a very long-winded answer <laughs> in answer to your question about where the story came from but a beautiful answer nonetheless and so then Gemma uh, how did you become involved and what about Alice do you love playing so I became involved in a very sort of non-traditional way so I have a production company that looks for female-led content and so somebody had told me about Summerland and Jess and I had worked together um, on a play called Nell Gwynn and so we'd gotten to know each other on that and so I said oh will you send me this film Summerland I've heard about it um, and it, this was not as an actress this is just me as a producer looking for content and um, and all I knew about it was that it was about an older woman and a young boy in the, in the 1940s. And so Jess sent it to me. I knew nothing about it, which is the best way of going about watching this film or reading it as, as I was at the time. And Alice was originally written older than me, so not my playing age. So I was not considering it as an actress at all, even when reading it, but loved it it just took my breath away and I thought it was so clear and beautifully realized even in the script I could see the world that that Jess wanted to make and so after reading it and crying a lot and um, that never happens by the way when reading scripts I'm like stone cold usually but um, this one really got me um, and so I called Jess and said let's make this and and you you have to direct it and and then she eventually said well you should play Alice and I'll I'll adapt it so that Alice is a bit younger so you can play it um which was an amazing opportunity for me because Alice is such a in comparison to the roles that I've previously played um a, a, a quite a departure and I loved how you know unapologetically cantankerous and difficult she is and there are obviously reasons for that she's you learn about her heartbreak and how she's been sort of abandoned in life and she's protecting herself from all of that by being the most difficult person to be around and but I loved that and that even though and I think at the time I was really aware of this whole likable female lead thing which just you know, <laughs> drives me up the wall. So I thought, oh yes, at last, you know, a great character that is, you know, not maternal, not um, kind to children, not, you know, she's difficult, but you, and yet there was so much wit in there that you couldn't help but like her or want to watch her or find her amusing in some way. So that was why I was just, yeah so flattered that Jess would want me to play her. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I love her character so much. Um, so then, Gugu, uh, how did you become involved and what did you love about playing Vera? 
Yeah, well, I've known Jess for a long, long time. And mm. like Gemma, you know, we've worked together in theatre on the same play, but in different productions, you know, which is kind of, you know, rarely, rarely happens. And um, I've been such a fan of Jess as a human and as an artist, you know, in, in the theatre world. And um, so I knew that Jess was developing this script um, through BAFTA and, you know, moving from theater to film and screenwriting. And um, initially I think that Jess just told me about the, the story before I'd really had a chance to read it. And I just thought it was so original and really moving when she pitched it to me and described the whole world. I just found it um, really just special and emotional and, um, and unique and um, yeah so that was sort of probably a couple of years before the actual film you know was, was still being being developed and um, and then you know much later on um, you know I knew that Gemma was producing it and that they had worked together to to you know get the film off the ground and when Jess invited me to be to play Vera I was kind of surprised because I, you know, I, I knew she she was so excited about it, but I didn't know that she had envisioned me to be in it. So, um, you know, similarly to Gemma, I was, you know, I kind of looked at it quite objectively, you know, as a as a sort of piece, you know, w without my contribution. And um, and I was just thrilled, you know, to be able to be a part of Jess's first film, and you know, such a beautiful story, and and like she said, you know, such an interesting um, way to look at written and historically and all the layers and the twists and turns in the story um and having worked quite a lot in america the last few years it was you know really special and and, and refreshing for me to do something that felt so thoroughly british in its themes and um and such a a, a fun vibrant character to play yeah yeah you know, when i was watching summerland it did some parts of it um did remind me a little bit about a movie called Come Away, which you are also in. Oh. <laughs> um, and, and so did you feel like there was sort of a, um, a little bit of a similarity in terms of a magical quality also with that? That's really interesting. So Come Away is a film that um, uh, was produced by David E. Um, and uh, is, is based on um, sort of the fairy tale of, I guess, Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan. Um, that's so interesting because I filmed them actually very close together. I mean, Come Away, I only did, you know, one day on that film. You know, um, I played the older Alice, mm -hmm. Alice in Wonderland once she's grown up. So, um, spoiler alert. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but basically they, they were happening at the same time. And I think, um, yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't really think of them as, as, as similar in a way, but I know what you mean in terms of the idea of, of, of storytelling and in terms of the idea of things from a child's perspective, you know. Um, but I felt like that, you know, certainly for my character and for Vera, this was, you know, a much, a, a very different journey in terms of the love story and um, in terms of, you know, how Vera appears, you know, in from Alice's perspective, um, in sort of flashback, and um, yeah, so that's interesting that you made that comparison. I hadn't really, hadn't really thought about it. <laughs> well, uh, this one is for Gemma and Gugu. Um, is it is it almost a relief to play original characters in period pieces as opposed to uh, characters on, in biopics or adaptations, which are normally what we would expect from period pieces? Um, I would say yes. Um, I haven't done that many, um, but I definitely feel, feel like you can, obviously you can, you can just do whatever, you know, you don't have to sort of do an imitation or impersonation or whatever, you know, people call it, um, um, an embodiment or whatever they call it. I, I just love that. But at the same time, um, I, I, I'm, I'm playing Dusty Springfield in something in the future and that's something that I'm really excited about because I feel like there's so much of her that's not known. So there's so much more that I could bring to her aside from her performance um, and the way that p people knew her through her performance. They didn't really know anything about her as a person. So in that sense, I'd feel a little bit more free with that. But yeah, I, I, I mean, it's just a whole nother 
another thing that you don't have to worry about when they ha when they haven't lived or don't live now mm -hmm. um offending anybody or you know misrepresenting anybody so i i personally feel like it's a freedom yeah i mean i agree i i found it very liberating and i think you know and i think that the essence of vera is very free as well so that was that was great. And also, interestingly, at the same time as we were shooting this, I was also preparing for a film called Misbehaviour, in which I do play a real life person. And she's not as well known as someone like Dusty Springfield, but she, she was a, she's a real woman that I, that I met pretty much two weeks after I wrapped shooting uh, Summerland, you know, and it's a different um, responsibility I think you know when you're playing somebody that's really lived and you know this character in, in that film was a you know the first woman of color to play Miss World and um, you know she's she had a huge amount of notoriety and fame at that time you know so you're looking back and you want to honor that person I think but I think there's a difference between when you're playing someone that really exists, you know, it's not a documentary, you're not doing an impersonation. You want, you want, you want to honor them, but you don't necessarily, you want them to like it, obviously, but you don't, you're not, you're not, you're not, your intention is not um, to please them. It's to honor the story always, you know, ultimately. So, um, so yeah, and, it, and in this, I think, you know, knowing that it had come from Jess's imagination, but it was also hugely, the themes were hugely personal to, to Jess and, and her life. And, and um, that I felt like, even though it wasn't, even though Vera wasn't a real person, I felt that there was so much of Jess in the story and because we know each other so well, you know, there's so much of her in all the characters. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I just, um, I just found it very freeing to put, to play Vera, especially. Um, and I think, you know, whenever a character is, you know, completely fictional like that, it, it gives you a lot more freedom to, to create. Absolutely. A uh, reminder to the patrons, type any questions in if you have any, um, but I've, I've certainly got more. Mm -hmm. um, Jessica, can you, you've talked a little bit about this already, but um, there's so much to tie together between the location of the film and the magical realism. Um, did it have to be Kent? Was it actually filmed in Kent, by the way? And, and, and did it have to be um, in this place um, because it ties so much to the just mythological aspects? Um, what was important to me that was that it was a landscape that we could fall in love with and that would inspire something sort of in our souls that made you feel like magic might really exist. And I think in a sense that could be anywhere. The reason why Kent is referenced in the story is because when I was doing my research, I came across a very obscure um, book and an article in the book which was about um, Fata Morgana and these islands that people had seen over time in lots of different places um, and one piece of uh, what the, the kind of clue of the references was the fact that there was an article written in at the end of the 1800s in a newspaper from Kent saying that the people of um, Ramsgate had been looking out to see and they'd seen Dover Castle which is around the following the next cliff floating out on the sea and that really really happened um, you know, which was kind of very odd, but of course it's a mirage. It's about reflection and refraction. And um, that's the first time I've been able to say those two words without hodging them together. <laughs> a tongue twister. The Negroni obviously helps. Um, <laughs> who knew? Um, but yeah, I found that article and thought, this is really interesting. You know, this this is something which perhaps could tie into the notion of people seeing an idea of heaven, which made me investigate the notion of heaven across culture and, and in different traditions. And that's when I started looking at pagan heaven and found this idea of Summerland. And Summerland is actually, I hodged it a little bit in the film, but the notion of it is essentially a sort of land on top of ours, which already exists, which people who've passed away could somehow communicate with or see the world as it is. And I loved that idea. And I liked the idea that if you were in Summerland, maybe even if we couldn't see you, perhaps you could 
leave patterns or move sticks around and show people a sign to give them hope that death wasn't the end. Um, and so there was something about that part of the world that um, is so beautiful that it seemed like it would be a really sensible place to set the film. And so when we were scouting, we actually looked all over the country um, and, and really the reason for filming there very specifically was because that's where we found the hero house, um, the house that's in the film. And I had thought that I had such a specific idea of what that house ought to be in my head that we were going to have to build it. I was a bit worried we were going to have to add an extra million quid into the budget <laughs> in order to build a set because I thought there's no way we're going to find a house which, you know, in the script I described it so particularly in terms of the wind chimes and the edge of the world and the cliffs and the way the water hits the rocks underneath it and thought, well, how would that exist? And then found that house um, and couldn't quite believe. I was really emotional actually when we when we went to see it because I thought, this 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 is the house in my head. Mm -hmm. I wrote this house this is so strange someone's built the house that it was only part of my imagination and um we were very very lucky because actually the woman that owns that house um the exterior that had been used a number of times for locations but no one had ever been allowed to shoot inside not a whole movie because she didn't want to sort of give the house up for two months and move out quite rightly um but we sent her the script and said, oh, just, just read it just in case. And she came straight back and she said, I can't believe it. This house, it feels like you wrote this story for my house. And I said, well, it feels like your house was created for this story. So can we enchant Yeah. And it was just a really lovely sort of moment of um, a beautiful coincidence. But uh, yeah, a joyous thing to be able to work there. But it's sort of... I feel like it's a story that I hope is universal and as much as it's about English folklore it's actually about hope and um, the possibilities of something beyond and I think that in a way it could have been set anywhere with a sort of mystical tradition. Oh absolutely yeah I, I agree completely. Um, so th there are several aspects of the relationship in this movie. Um, they're in, they start two women start a relationship in the 1920s and it's an interracial relationship. Yeah. And I feel like most, most pictures would take the route of showing a lot of the hardships and suffering that Alice and Vera would have gone through um, at the ha hands of society during that time. Um, this movie doesn't do that. And I, I actually love that it doesn't do that, but why, why does it not do that? That was a really conscious choice. That was a really conscious choice because I feel like so often when um, homosexuality is depicted on screen or when um, stories about people of colour are, are depicted on screen, they're limited to stories where that is the focus of the story. Um, this is a film where the central gay love story, which is a period love story, doesn't um, rise and fall on whether it's possible to be gay in that period and how difficult it is to deal with your sexuality. It's about the things that affect everybody and the universal themes. So, so the reason why the two women break up isn't because it's terribly difficult for them to be gay in the face of the criticism that they get from the outside. It's about the fact that they want two different things. And um, my observation of my gay friends, of which I obviously have many coming through the theatre, um, is that, you know, to be in a gay relationship is as um, multifaceted and as complex um, as a straight relationship. And I think it's really, really important that if we're to accept people, more um, and that if we're to sort of support people loving whoever they want to love which I feel very very strongly about then in order for people who might be naive about that to learn about you know and to accept 
people of all persuasions, you know, it's really important that we tell all of those stories and that, that you can have two gay characters in a film where the theme isn't ostensibly only about that aspect of their lives. And that's the same for me in terms of the fact that it's an interracial relationship. It's not the focus of the story because actually I really, really, really want to see stories about people of colour which are not just about race. And there are so many fantastic actors of all backgrounds. If we limit actors of colour to playing in parts that are only uh, stories where race is the central theme, then what a shame, you know. That's how it's been for a long time, I feel. And um, it's made me really sad. And I feel like you should be able to cast everybody in every role. And, and as somebody who lives in a really multicultural part of London, I really, really want the local people around me to be able to come to the cinema where I, you know, at the end of my road and to see films where they see themselves on screen in every film, um, in the same sort of level of diversity as you see in real life. And I think we have to work much, much harder to make that happen. And I hope that it's not um, doing any sort of disservice in terms of the reality of how difficult those things would have been at the time. That is something I was very conscious of, but I just thought, you know, we have to start telling these stories and not make that the central premise. Mm -hmm. If we are to normalise, uh, you know, diversity on screen, which I think we need to. Yeah, I mean, beautifully, beautifully said. Um, so when watching this film, I, I, sometimes we get a bit of a sense of um, Douglas Sirk, or maybe even uh, Todd Haynes. And uh, I was wondering if these were influences or, or were there any influences at all? I know this is an original story, but I'm wondering if there were any other influences. Oh, well, that's a good question, actually. Um, not really specifically. Funnily enough, when people say, you know, uh, I shouldn't read comments on YouTube, but I always do. It's the same with plays and people who say, oh, it's, this seems really based on X, Y, Z film or story. And I think, oh, well, that's funny because I never read that ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and I, the reason why I say that is because I feel like what happens when you're a writer and a director is that rather than there being one or two, for me, rather than there being a particular couple of people who are influences, I've got hugely eclectic taste and probably slightly too wide ranging. And so rather than borrowing from one person or one tradition specifically, I feel like the things that have influenced this film are everything from the sort of, um, the sort of culture of being, seeing mummers plays when I was on holiday as a kid in Cornwall and sort of looking at scarecrows and thinking, what's that? That's really strange. It's sort of more about observations about weird English culture and actually films like The Wicker Man, which made me think, oh, it's sort of simultaneously sexy and mysterious and weird. Um, but also novels. Like, I, I love magic realism and um, Gemma and I are actually working on a story at the moment. We're doing our next project together, in, which is sort of based on a magic realism tradition, which has really made me sort of take note of the fact it's something that's always appealed to me. And I think that's because as, as an artist, you love the idea of there being something a little bit more um, magical than what really exists. So it's, it's probably more novels actually for me, books like The Time Traveller's Wife, which I loved about the possibility of something beyond, yeah, or particular characters like Scout, for example, in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. I love, I always loved young protagonists. And um, so yeah, sort of a, a, a meeting of lots of different things. My mum my was an English teacher, so I was uh, probably more au fait with novels than I was with films growing up because we didn't have a TV for a very long time and I wasn't allowed to go to the cinema. So yeah, I think, um, I think stories were the influence. Excellent. I'm about to go to um, patron questions. My last one before that is though, um, during these current times, movies about loss and love and human connection um, hit different 
these days. They, they have a bit of a, a different sort of resonance than maybe before. And I just think that that's a really interesting point because when you wrote this movie, when you shot this movie, it was a different world. And I think it's a very interesting thing to, what does that feel like to you to know that this movie um, would have resonated regardless, but resonates in a different way now? Is that a question to me? To anyone, anyone, anyone honestly. Um, to, just to briefly speak for myself, um, I sort of have made it my purpose to tell stories that have a seam of optimism and hope. That's the probably the only thing that ties all of my work together, and it always has. I've I've always valued sort of entertainment and a brightness and heart really at the heart of what I want to do. And, and I think that there's absolutely a place for sort of searing political dramas and, and bleak tragedy. That's just not me. I'm never going to tell those stories. I leave them to the people that want to spend their long days writing that stuff. Um, and then I will enjoy it as a, as a um, consumer. But I think um, one thing that was important was that I lost my father while we were making this film. Um, I, and when I wrote it, I didn't know that he was ill. And um, I've always wanted to entertain. And I've always thought that it was such a shame that we sort of somehow um, put tragedy on a pedestal as the most important, sort of the, the most worthy form of art. Because I've always thought, I don't, I don't really agree. I feel like something that can move you and that has heart and drama in the arts, those stories are really, really hard to tell. It's very hard to make people laugh and to make people cry as well. And and there's a real place for that. And when he was really ill, he very specifically stopped wanting to watch anything that was too negative. He, he really wanted to watch stories which would uplift him and give him hope and brightness. And he knew he had a very limited amount of time and he wanted to fill it with stories that made him feel good and remember all the great things in the world and and the possibilities of you know, a life however short. And I thought at the time, well, that's what I want to do is to, to make stories for him um, and for people in that position. And what's, what I obviously had no idea at the time that that would then be the experience in one sense of everybody, that we would all suddenly be reminded of how short life was and how precious it is and how much time we've spent sort of worrying about the wrong things when actually we should be focusing on being kind and being supportive and valuing the underdogs in our society and so i feel like i made it i made it for me it became something that um i made for him and for people having that experience and then weirdly completely unexpectedly that turned out to be nearly everybody around the globe <laughs> um but i mean that to me is a testament to the fact that that's what the you know that is a, a valuable reason for making art like if you can uplift people a little bit then that's worthwhile mm. i love that that ties directly into a question i had but i will honor the patron questions and ask um someone asked what was it like to work with Frank and the other children in general? Gemma? Uh, oh, for Oh, that... yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's always a challenge. Um, when you know that there's children in the script, you can go one of many ways. But we were really lucky on this one that um, there was a long and lengthy process to find Frank and Edie. And... Um, and it was really important. And Jess, you did do um, workshops with them to see how they took direction and how they responded. Um, um, because he, I mean, particularly Lucas, who plays Frank, um, he's in most of the film. And um, it wasn't the, we didn't have the longest amount of time to shoot. And we were very pressurized time-wise. And he needed to be focused the whole time, which he was. He was just amazing. Very, very, both of both Dixie, who plays um, Edie and Lucas, are really mature for their age, like most children nowadays, I guess. Um, so they were always professional, always knew all their lines, always were really focused. 
they took it seriously but not too seriously they were having fun and were really um actually just lovely to work with just a real pleasure it was I've worked with children before where if they were a bit younger it's it becomes quite difficult if you're doing heavy scenes or manip you sort of have to kind of be very thoughtful about how you're going to work with them so as not to damage them in you know or upset them whereas they were just at the right age where they they absolutely understood what was going on and um, that was a great relief but they were they were amazing they were just weren't, weren't they they were so so brilliant yeah. yeah it was it was a real I feel like I could put money on the fact that those two will be a sir and a dame in 50 years and uh, you know we were we had sir tom courtney in our cast and i'm absolutely convinced we're gonna get a sir lucas bond because he's not only the most tremendously talented kid um well he's now a teenager it's weird because we shot two years ago so i'm pretty sure he's about a foot taller now and his voice will have broken and we'll all be a little bit broken hearted that frank small frank is is no longer with us and he's grown um but it's a tremendous risk writing something with a lead part for a small kid. And I did worry that I had really dug a massive hole for myself by doing that because it's so unpredictable and you really don't know until you're on set. But um, we auditioned loads and loads and loads of kids and it was quite obvious actually, not necessarily because of his experience, because he didn't have very much, but because of his curiosity, and his brightness and the spark in him and his intelligence. And not only was that something where I thought, I know that we can work together, but it was also, those are qualities that good actors have. And he's so generous and so sort of buoyant and also really game, which is really important. You know, when you can just throw something at someone and say, well, try it like this. And he was always up for it. Um, but credit to the actors he was working with, and Gemma in particular, as, as you know, she was in almost every scene with him, to watch him watching her, and, and Gemma was really generous with her time in terms of teaching him quite specific sort of technical skills and giving him lots of tips and watching them work together um, was really great. Um, to the extent that by the time we finished the movie, I'd sometimes look round and think, well, he's doing that Gemma trick before the scene starts to get into mode of character and think, oh yeah, you, you've you been learning from the pros, yeah. You, uh, you mentioned Tom Courtney and that is a question um, someone brought up. They said, what was it like directing and acting with Tom Courtney? They also wanted to know if the evacuation letter ending up in Alice's mailbox was orchestrated by Vera. Yeah. Uh, the second part that's very easy to answer yes it was um, I hope that's obvious because there's been a couple of questions in sort of people asking on Twitter and in reviews to say oh it's what a big coincidence and I thought it's not a coincidence I feel like that's clear maybe it's not but she uh, Vera absolutely orchestrated that she works at the ministry and maybe that's a British thing but we know that the ministry means the government and that was who was organizing the evacuation i mean goose i don't know if you want to talk any more about that as your oh no i mean exactly i always saw it that that was completely deliberate that was sort of the love the uh, a love letter really it, in a sense putting that those those things together without spoiling it too much for everyone or well, if anyone hasn't seen it but but um but yeah i i absolutely saw that as 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 vera's you know um intention and um and and as you said like the ministry being out that where, where she's working that she has access to all of that um information and and you know completely intended um for that to be where, where frank ended up yeah and as for Tom Courtney, I mean, he's a legend, really. So do you know what? What was quite interesting was that it was wonderful working with him, but we did, um, I, we knew he wanted to do it, but with someone like Tom, you know, it's quite a lot to take on a new movie because he was already working quite hard. He was doing the Eddie Redmayne film um, about the air balloon and 
he didn't have a tremendous amount of time. So Gemma and I went round. Do you remember, Gemma? We went round for soup at his house and to, to do our little persuasion and to make sure that he decided to say absolutely yes to agreeing to do the movie with us. And he's such a gentleman, but he does have a wonderful, massive dog called Stanley. And I think the fact that Stanley took to Gemma and I meant that Tom <laughs> trusted us because he seems to think that anybody who gets on with his dog and who likes his dog is, um, <laughs> is good, a good soul. And um, yeah, he, he, he's a wonderful, wonderful actor. And I felt like it was a huge privilege to have him in the cast. But what's lovely about those older actors and you realise that that's a reason why they've worked for so long. It's not just because they're talented, but it's because they're kind and generous and they're a really great presence on the set and they have time to look after younger actors like Lucas and Dixie as well. And I think that's, you know, why they've had such long careers, actually, because they're people that you want to work with again and again. Yeah. I have two more questions. They are both for all of you. And... Um, Jessica, like you were saying, um, your dad just wanted to see a lot of comfort films um, near the end. And uh, from personal experience, every time I've been grieving, that that's what's um, kept me going. And during this time, that's what's kept a lot of people going too. I would love to know if each of you have a comfort film. Oh. <laughs> One film. I don't know. It's hard. Lockdown started. I only wanted to watch '90s movies. Like mm -hmm. I only wanted to watch movies that I'd seen before. Either they were like Richard Curtis movies, or like stuff from the '90s that was just like a period piece, like Gladiator or something. <laughs> you know, like something that I didn't need any surprises. <laughs> Like, the world is already uncertain enough. I want to see films from like my childhood and my teens that, you know, not that are predictable, but just somehow there was a comfort in that, that the good, mm. good movies, like, like I rewatched The English Patient again the other day and I was like, oh, oh no, Anthony Minghella, like, oh my God, like the talented Mr. Ripley, you know, the, those kind of films that you, those grown up, sophisticated, but they, like, you know, grown up dramas that are, you know, harder to come by these days, I think. Yeah. I, I just find really, and really- And beautifully cool. made films that are, mm -hmm. for me, if Emma Thompson's in it, Emma Thompson is my absolute heroine. I'm gonna carry on saying this on every Zoom until she wants to do a film with me. I watched Sense of Sensibility actually as well early yeah. on in lockdown, that was on the list, yeah. I was, I was about to say my comfort film, if I had to do my Desert Island film, if everything was going to be washed away apart from one film, it would probably be Ang Lee's Sense and Sensibility, which Emma Thompson both rocked my world in and wrote the script in, because I think it's such a beautiful, beautiful movie. And as someone who I've just done an Austin adaptation myself, and I, I've been wary about doing that on screen for quite a while, because she did such an incredible version of that um, story that I feel like for a long time nobody would touch the Austin world again because she she just how could you possibly better it Gemma do you have one so yeah I'm just thinking about it and actually it's all of the 1960s um magical uh children's films like Mary Poppins Chitty Chitty Bang Bang Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Bedknobs and Broomsticks, all of those films. And I just realised, like, that's where my fascination with magic realism comes from, because it's, they're all about magic. And yeah. they're all set, they're so realistic, but then all this magical stuff happens and you just accept it. Mm -hmm. And those are the films I, I come back to time and time again, never get bored of, ever. Oh, well, <laughs> choices. Um, so my last question brings it back to... Summerland. Um, as you've said, to Summerland, and it's said in the movie, is um, there's a lot about finding the magic and the love in the here and the now and finding your version of Summerland. Uh, so what is your version of Summerland for each of you right now? Oh, Tiffany, yes. you are such good questions. <laughs> They're really deep. <laughs> <laughs> good 
Oh my God. What's I have to say like, you know, in this time as well, when we've been away from like friends and family and, you know, being back in the UK is very special to me, you know, and, and, and Oxfordshire, which is where I'm from. And, you know, I think you appreciate these places that maybe you took for granted when you were young, you know, places that seemed stuffy and boring. And actually you're like, wow, this place is, is magical and amazing. And, um, you know, being able to, you know, like the film itself, you know, I think that the idea of being an evacuee is, you know, being away from our parents, being away, from, not being able to see your parents for all this time. I don't know. I just feel like there is something very, very special about um, the British countryside and, you know, having, having been away, I, I really do appreciate it more and more. Yeah. I think, yeah. Summerland is, um, Summerland is not not only a notion of um, heaven, but in the film it becomes, that is what it is literally, it's a pagan version of heaven, so it's to do with where the dead people are and how they connect with the living people. But actually it becomes more than that in my head in the film, it becomes, is that a dog behind you? Yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It was just, it looked like oh, a dog just threw it out of your shoulder. <laughs> just like literally. Um, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry to interrupt that in the middle of a flow of a question, but it was really funny. Um, the the uh, Summerland to me in the film represents a sort of ideal of what, what if something perfect could exist, what that would be. A place where you could go that would make you feel reassured and happy. And for me right now, the thing I really miss is sharing my table with the people I love. And I like nothing more than having a group of people around for dinner. It's something that my boyfriend and I do a lot and we haven't done now for months. And if I could just have a, a big dinner with some really nice wine and all the people I love the most, just sat around doesn't matter what the food is we just have some drinks and have some company and be able to hug each other again that to me I had no idea how precious that was because I didn't know that that was something that we would ever lose but just having a group of friends and being able to be in the same room that's who knew that 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 would be such a fantasy but you know wow this time makes you appreciate that sort of thing You're all invited. I'm maybe not 38 <laughs> participants on the live Zoom. A very big kitchen, but you can try. <laughs> and Gemma, do you have a summer land? Yeah, I, I'm glad everyone else answers before me because it gives me time to think. Um, I think mine's nature. I, I live in the city and during lockdown, I was craving, craving, craving just forests and you know, just being able to look out and just see the nature. I mean, this, this is something that we take for granted so much when you live in, the, you know, in the built up place. And I think it's, I, that's the place where I really feel actually the most connected to the world. And, um, and, you know, lockdown's been amazing for me in terms of my relationships with people because I've connected more in a weird way. Um, but that's the thing that I felt I needed to like, and that's where you sort of, I don't know, it's, a, it's magical in a way, way when you go to somewhere that you feel you can just be there on your own and it can nourish you. Um, so, yeah, that's mine, I think. Yeah. Well, given that, um, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to the patrons, Lincoln Center. Um, enjoy uh, this congratulations on this film and especially congratulations on the fact that in the UK, People get to see it in theaters. Um, we are jealous, but happy for everyone out there. Um, oh, everybody I about that because um, there's an understanding that it's not available uh, at all in America. But actually, there's over a hundred screens that are now finally reopening, and they might be in random places. But it, you can see it on an actual screen in some parts of America, and also across the world. In case there's people listening from other parts of the world, so. Um, you know, just to support those local independent cinemas too. I hope everybody's watched it through the Lincoln Centre, but if you want to see it again, then you might be able to find mm -hmm. it. <laughs> <laughs>
Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and I hope you all have a great night. Great rest of your Thanks. night. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tiffany. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye.